Good afternoon. Welcome to Spy Chat. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us today. Our Executive Director, Chris Costa, as recently featured in People Magazine, more about that later, is joined by Gina Bennett, former CIA analyst and advisor. Bennett is a recently retired counterterrorism specialist who authored some of the earliest warnings of today's terrorism trends, including a 1993 report that served as the first warning of the growing danger of the movement Osama bin Laden was leading. She is an adjunct associate professor at Georgetown University Center for Security Studies. Bennett is often featured in documentaries and other media profiling her role in counterterrorism and as a pioneer for women in national security and intelligence careers. She is now continuing to lead the charge for young women as the new strategic advisor for girl security. And that's an organization which se seeks to empower, secure and advance young girls into national and international security missions. Bennett is the mother of five children who are the source of inspiration for her two books, National Security Mom One and Two. And she it compares national security to parenting in those books. And um, I am both, my hat is off to you both for your incredible career in national security and for being a mom of five. So after Chris and Gina speak about the, the issues that are catching their attention, we are gonna turn the program over to you and your questions. If you've been here before, um, or if you're here for the first time, please use the Q&A feature and write them in and we will do our best to get to as many of them as possible. Okay, enough from me. Over to you, Chris. Amanda, team, thanks for the great introductions. And I say this each time we have a special guest, what an honor and a privilege it is to have them because we're bringing on luminaries. I would just underscore the point that when I first met Gina at the White House, when she came into my office to talk to me about the threat, terrorism threat in particular, I think it was Al-Qaeda, I was in awe at her encyclopedic knowledge. Uh, we've become friends and it is tremendous to have her here today. So we are super grateful and it is an honor and a privilege to have Gina join us for Spy Chat. So all of that said, I'd like to dive in to a few of the stories that I am tracking as it relates to national security. First and foremost is a national security story that broke out in July. Uh, it was reported by um, multiple news outlets that Iranians are sending UAVs, unmanned aerial ve vehicles, into Ukraine to provide support to Russia on the ground. These UAVs will have an attack capability. These are advanced models and Iranians are sending technicians to support these efforts on the ground. We're talking about hundreds of UAVs. So that is a story that is very important. We'll hear more about that. This is a secret Iranian program that's been released to the media. It's been reported by the U.S. intelligence community. So I think that's a very important, current, germane story to our program today. The second one really took me by a little surprise. It's a story about an internal report that was produced by the Mossad, of course, the Israeli intelligence service. It was a report that analyzed a 1992 attack in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and a second attack in Argentina two years later, an attack on the Israeli embassy and an attack on a Jewish community center. Hundreds were killed and wounded in those horrific attacks in the early 1990s. Apparently, the report 
was made available to New York Times, and New York Times has published some articles about that particular report. And in it, what got my attention is the fact that, according to the New York Times, that the Iranians were long thought to have provided some operational preparation of the environment, if you will, on the ground in Argentina, uh, although Hezbollah actually executed the attack. This particular news article said that the Iranians weren't involved with the operational preparation of the attack, which I am extremely skeptical on. I've subsequently talked to experts on Hezbollah, and although we recognize that Hezbollah had an attack cell, an infrastructure to to execute these attacks, it is very doubtful that Iran did not have fingerprints on this particular attack. And also, it surprises me, why now, after all these years, would this reporting be released? I don't have an answer to that question, but I believe, one, Hezbollah has a worldwide attack capability. They demonstrated it in the early 1990s against Israeli targets and, as I said, uh, Jewish uh, individuals at this community center in Argentina. And also, the New York Times article made the point that Argentinians were not involved uh, at all in, in supporting passively or actively uh, the attackers. So it's, a, it's an article worth, uh, wor worth finding, digging up, and uh, probably worthy of some discussion. Um, the next article, which I found particularly interesting in July, the head of the British Security Service, better known as MI5, and the director of the FBI, Christopher Wray, did a joint conference in London. So it won't surprise this audience that uh, the two of them, the two leaders, underscored uh, the threat from China on really three vectors. One, hacking. Two, political influence and third stealing business secrets that continues to be a theme what's interesting is this was a joint conference the first of its kind uh with mi5 and as i said director ray so i found that interesting this shouldn't be a surprise to our audience but we need to continue to watch uh what we're seeing from china with regard to their espionage related activities and sort of related to the internal threat is a story that got my attention on the war in Ukraine. It's a bit dated. It happened in July. And of course, we focused a lot on Ukraine when we talked to uh, Malcolm Nance last month. Um, but um, it seems that President Zelensky is deeply concerned with fifth, with fifth column activities on the ground in Ukraine. And regarding those activities, he's very much concerned with the counterintelligence threat, meaning the internal threat, individuals in Ukraine that are providing reporting back to the Russians. Uh, so he fired his head of in, the internal uh, intelligence service, and he fired one of his chief prosecutors. And certainly, an important story that this audience is tracking. And I'd written a piece in The Hill. I hope you have an opportunity. We'll post it um, to look at the article, but on the Zawahiri strike. I'm not going to say that much about it because Gina may offer her perspectives being an expert on Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, and bin Laden. She might speak to it, but my theme was essentially the fact that an over-the-horizon strike took place against a high-value target in Kabul, Afghanistan. That demonstrates an excellent U.S. capability. That's not surprising to me, um, but more ominously, the fact that the Haqqani network is giving safe harbor to Zawahiri, that is a problem. And I think it opens the door for the United States to continue to develop human networks on the ground in Afghanistan. And I parroted from an article um, that uh, was written about General Carrilla, the U.S. Central Command commander who was in the stands. I think he was in Uzbekistan or Tajikistan. Um, Regardless, he underscored the importance of more human intelligence for his three priorities, Afghanistan, Afghanistan, Afghanistan. So as a result of Zawahiri, I think it's really important that the United States redoubles its focus on human intelligence reporting on Al-Qaeda and other terrorists that are operating in the space, because it's very clear 
that the Taliban cannot be trusted. Um, and certainly not least uh, the important stories I'm tracking. In fact, it's very important uh, to at least one family uh, in the United States. It is August 11th today. It is the 40th birthday of Austin Tice. We've talked about Austin Tice. He is being held by the Syrians who do not acknowledge holding uh, Austin. He, next week, August 14th, actually Sunday, will be the 10th year anniversary of his abduction, and it coincides with his 40th birthday. The President of the United States recently has assured the Tice family, Deborah and Mark Tice, and their entire family, that more is going to be done in the short term to press on Syria. So I'm waiting for those activities to play out. So that's something we could keep our eyes on in future spy chats. And I'll certainly remind everyone of the Austin Tice case. So I will just close it out there, but I also want to offer a book recommendation. The two books that Gina has written, I think not only are they readable, they're relatable to our audience. And I strongly encourage, I want to hold up National Security Mom, because I just read it and I was fascinated with her met metaphors, her storytelling, and again, how relatable her stories are to the average person sitting around the dinner fam table trying to raise a family. So thanks for all your contribution, Gina. I'll kick it over to you. Well, thank you, Chris. I really appreciate not only that, but the opportunity to be here um, speaking with you and your audience. Um, I, I have to say before commenting on a couple of your stories, what really impresses me about about what you do with this chat is the range of intelligence issues in the support that intelligence provides to national security. I mean, as you know, uh, I teach ethics in intelligence support to national security at Georgetown and have always um, really tried to impress upon my students understanding the full range of intelligence support to national security because it's, it's not just one type of support. I mean, you're looking at how does intelligence fit into preventing war or bringing war to a close very quickly? How does it fit into preventing um, all, all types of threats, not, not just terrorist threats, but cyber threats, intellectual property theft? I mean, all, and so I think that that is, that's very unique. And I appreciate that as a professor uh, trying to explain the full range of that. So that is, um, um, I especially had to note the, um, the joint uh, press conference that you referred to, the FBI and MI5. Uh, when, when we talk about it in my class, things like this, it's, it's immediately clear that a lot of people, in part because spytainment informs, I think, a lot of Americans as to what intelligence does. I think a lot of people don't understand the extent to which the United States intelligence community stays out of economic espionage, this type of, you know, this type of thing, because it's so important to the core of our democracy to be, for our government to be disinterested in the sense of being objective and not prioritizing or privileging or um, supporting one business over another. So we have to be this very hands off, but that is absolutely not true of other governments like China. So I thought that was particularly interesting. Thank you for raising that. <laughs> Um, as you noted, I am particularly interested in um, maybe offering some conversation around the Zawahiri uh, strike and just, you know, what does this mean for us, for America, not just the over the horizon and what to expect on the, on the threat side, but um, in reading the, there was a Hill article, I think it was Emily Harding, who was just posing a lot of very, I think, important and interesting questions about how do we measure success in over the horizon? And I think it's also a, a broader question of how do we measure success in counterterrorism, period? And we've had, I mean, we're a month out from our 21st you know, year from 9-11. And so it's it's been quite a while that we have thought about terrorism 
and counterterrorism in the sense of success is the absence of attacks. And I think you know Harding in her article also poses, you know, that is an extremely high bar for a metric of success, um, the absence of attacks. And it has always led to the question of if we have an attack, is that automatically failure of our entire counterterrorism apparatus and community? And I know I for one would say absolutely not, but I think it's it's really time for the American people to be thinking about when are we done with achieving justice against Al Qaeda for 9-11? You know, is it is there at any point where we can say, okay, we've held accountable the the individuals who were responsible, um, the individuals who facilitated uh, the leadership of the organization that enabled this attack. And now we have to be thinking not as much about the past, but about the future. And where does our counterterrorism focus, apparatus, community, and our and the resources and expenditure that go with all of that need to be, as opposed to continually living with um, the ghost and legacy of an incident that happened 21 years ago. And I'm not trying to say that that wasn't extremely important or tragic. It's just, we do, I think at some point have to have a conversation around um, when are we done? Uh, it, it's just, uh, it's, it's a hard conversation, but I think um, again, as a parent, as a mother, it's uh, one of those difficult things we, we talk about with our children too. At, you know, at what point do you have to now start focusing forward and accept that what's happened has happened and realize that um, there's only but so much energy and resource and focus in the world for you to make everything right. And we can't, can't always do that. So anyway, I wanted to respond to that because I know we're thinking more in terms of, are we gonna be able to identify and prevent every terrorist attack that might come out of Afghanistan? And I think we need to be honest with ourselves. The answer to that is always going to be no. No, there's no omniscient intelligence service in the world that could ever possibly do that. Uh, I also think it's, you know, it's really important to understand with that, that to some extent, if we can put Al Qaeda as far into the history books as possible, take the, the influence that they're still trying to have on us and on others and you know, more near term audiences for them in the, the Middle East and South Asia and allow it to no longer influence our decision-making to allow it to not influence how we prioritize our defense posture, our laws, our, our um, way of life, the more we do that, the more damage we actually do to these organizations because the only thing they really fear is being irrelevant. And you know we have the power to make them irrelevant. It doesn't take anything more than being resistant and resilient. And it's a hard thing to do, but um, I'm hoping that with the Zawahiri strike, maybe we can start having a more transparent conversation between intelligence community, government, the counterterrorism apparatus in particular, and the public on these kinds of issues. And I, the one other thing I wanted to note that you, of the, of the um, issues that you brought up, um, I think similar to that, the idea of when are we done and what, you know, what is actual counterterrorism success? Um, the drones uh, story, the UAVs of Iran sending them to Russia for the fight in Ukraine, you know, this is one of those things from you know 30, 40 years ago, you realize every time there's an innovation in warfare and you know the execution of violence, whatever it is, there's always the fear of what is the long term from you know, we saw it with the arms race even in World War One and World War II to the nuclear arms race. Now we're thinking about space, the cyber race, you know, who can outdo whom. And um, it's very difficult to anticipate the second, third, fourth, fifth order effects as we innovate. But I think it's always important, uh, again, as an ethics professor, 
to to think about those things at the outset you know as we use the means that we have do we think ahead of time about how others will use those means when they inevitably achieve that capability and i i thought that that story was one that really brings that issue into focus and, and i hope maybe spawns more conversations about the ethical use of not just weaponry but just technology in general and um kind of the precedence that we set when we use it but i want to stop there for a moment chris i I know you have um, probably similar and also very different views on some of these things. I'd love for you to, to bounce back, <laughs> fight back like we did in the old days. <laughs> that was an excellent articulation of some of the issues that are so relevant. And it's great that Georgetown has you. I should I should give a shout out to Georgetown because I also uh, teach a course on counterterrorism. I think the issues you raise are really important regarding counterterrorism. When does this end? Uh, this is a continuum. When can we declare some modicum of success? And you know, unfortunately, the tired metaphor of a disease that can be controlled but it can't be completely eliminated still applies, in my humble opinion. But everything you said about technologies is so true. It's it's there's a double edge now of um, of the technological capabilities that states have. So I think those are all excellent, excellent points. What I'd like to do is kick it over to Amanda and let's let's just pivot off some of the questions because I see they're being loaded up. Um, thanks, Gina. That was a great, uh, great overview. Yeah, right. It was terrific um, and very wide ranging as our questions are likely to be. Um, great question um, about you know, with the loss of Osama bin Laden and al-Zawari. Um, where is al-Qaeda now in terms of strength and as a threat to the U.S. and the rest of the world? Should ordinary folks be concerned of the possibility of another 9-11-like attack? Or who should we be worrying about? No, it's a good question. And, it, you know, it's hard for me to answer that question because, um, it really define. I mean, it depends on how you define the threat and strength. I mean, I've never thought Al Qaeda was a strong organization ever. Um, you know, it. If you think about what it's trying to sell, like its its ideology, its form of governance structure, which is what Al Qaeda and ISIS have both been trying to propagate, the idea of an antiquated Islamic caliphate, you know, reinstalled around the world. It's not popular anywhere. Um, we saw a very fleeting toying with it, you know, when ISIS held territory, but that that didn't last, and it wasn't it it, it didn't really go very far anyway. Um, it's always I think CSIS at one point um, did a statistic analysis on this and concluded that if you took Al Qaeda and ISIS at their highest membership, the number and you overlaid that on the number of, of practicing Muslims in the world, statistically, it was like 0. 0.00000 something percent. It is statistically zero, right? And yet the counterterrorism community, the, the, the people who are involved in safety of our infrastructure and our people and our transportation, they have to do what they have to do. And we need to protect our people, our buildings, our board, all of those things against any kind of threat, right? But to consider that a national security threat when there are on the flip side, 99.9999999, you know, percent who aren't our enemy is, I think, um, inflating the strength of the problem to a degree that is, is um, not only fictitious, but is really unhelpful. So, I mean, I, you know, look again, mom, I, I approach it the same way as I did sending my kids off to school. Chances were they were going to get hurt. They were going to get sick. They were going to, you know, there's a lot of, you can't prevent it all. Um, but I wouldn't want to rob them of enjoying life in order to keep them safe. 
Yeah, and I don't have that much more to to offer other than to say we've focused today's discussion on Afghanistan in particular, but consider that Al Qaeda has affiliates and branches elsewhere in the world. So we are worried about the aspirational aspects of Al Qaeda trying to get another aircraft, which we know that um, Al Shabaab was trying to get an aircraft to try to. Uh, do a repeatable attack somewhere in the world against U.S. interests. So these things are going to continue to come up. Uh, again, it's going to be thwarted, I think, by uh, Western intelligence services and foreign partners, and it's not going to go away, but we can't be paralyzed by fear. Um, but we we lived in, I know Gina similar to all the CT professionals I know. Uh, we don't sleep well at night. No one sleeps well because you recognize there's somebody out there that is a threat. We stay on top of those threats to the extent that we can. But I think Gina has a very pragmatic approach uh, to a problem that she has studied with an unblinking eye for decades. So thanks for that, Gina. What else we have, Amanda? Well, this is um, this is great. Who should we be more worried about, foreign terrorism or domestic terrorism? That obviously relates to the United States, but that's a great question. Yeah, and, and I um, I think again, it depends what you mean by more afraid of. Um, clearly, terrorists that are engaged or terrorism in the United States, like. Timothy McVeigh, Jerry Nichols, and the Oklahoma City bombing, for example, is um, has a tremendous impact. It reverberates in a very different way than than terrorist strikes from um, that are organized abroad and you know imported in. But it really all still comes down to the same thing. Uh, you know, these terrorist attacks are mass murders, right? Or they're attempted mass murders and mass disruptions. And that's why, as Chris said, you know, the professionals in this business trying to prevent it don't sleep at night. But we try to be the ones to not sleep at night so that everybody else can, because it, you know, at the at the time of the attack, it's tragic, it's horrific, it's traumatizing for everyone, for everyone watching, for everyone involved. Um, but we can all then choose what to do next. Right, we can decide either, okay, I'm never going to go on an airplane again, or I'm never going to go in a public building, or whatever. We can, we can let that continual fear, um, and that's okay. I mean, if someone feels that way, that's okay. But we can also decide, um, no, we're, you know, I get what they're, what, you know, I heard their platform, I disagree, and I am not letting those people influence my behavior or who I am or what I do. And in that sense, there's no difference between whether it's foreign or domestic. Um, the bottom line is whatever is motivating someone to engage in the use of a mass murder, that's what it is. You know, it's a, it's a horrific criminal activity of mass murder. Whatever is motivating them to do it, they're, they're doing that to make you afraid and to make you um, change your behavior in some way, shape, or form, or change your set of beliefs. So the solution to it is still the same. And how much you're afraid of it really depends on the level of influence it has on you. Um, now, if we face increased incidents of domestic-inspired or domestic terrorism in this country, um, I think we're going to have a very interesting conversation about um, law enforcement and our police force and um, exactly how much we have deprioritized or, or over prioritized the debate rages, their ability to pr prevent violence is, you know, preventing violence is very difficult, so. Yeah, and I don't have that much to offer other than to repeat what I've said in past spy chats, which I think parrots the FBI's perspective, Director Ray's perspective, and I I, I believe he's really nailed uh, the 
the priorities uh, toward domestic violent extremism. And certainly this administration, within the first 90 days, published their first strategy on domestic violent extremism. And Gina knows this. She was the one that helped drive and push across the finish line our national counterterrorism strategy that built in domestic violent extremism, something that I was I was struggling to get across the finish line during my tenure at the at the White House for a variety of reasons. All of that said, rhetoric matters, misinformation and disinformation matters, and people are animated by the polarization of our society to take up arms at some level. And I don't want to be hysterical on this because it is relative. But just today, I haven't had the chance to absorb what happened. It literally broke out while we were preparing for spy chat, but it seems there was some kind of uh, political violence um, directed at an FBI field office. I don't think any FBI agents were injured, but rhetoric equals violence and political violence is wrong any way you look at it. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, scary, scary commentary from a lot of historians lately about how destabilizing um, these forces are on, on the country. So uh, one more or a couple more terrorism questions have popped up. Um, do you feel like our open border in the southern U.S. has led to terrorists entering the U.S. from that direction? No. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Um, how much of a threat to the U.S. is the instability in Afghanistan with the Taliban currently in charge? Uh, um, I, again, I, I have a very different sense of what threatens the United States and what doesn't. And um, I don't think the instability in Afghanistan or the instability in really very many places um, other than the instability in the United States um, I'm, I'm a big believer of Abraham Lincoln's Lyceum Address, and I think the only thing that threatens us is us, and so the instability in our country is by far the greater concern in, to me, um, not just of terrorism, but politically, you know, in general, than anywhere else. Uh, that being said, <clears throat> as Chris talked about, you know, safe havens, there are havens or, you know, pockets of places around the world where extremists who for their own set of reasons, have um, designs on the United States, on our people and facilities overseas, as well as the United States proper. And they will use these places as long as they can to plot and plan and aspire, and at times succeed in those aspirations. And Afghanistan is, you know, under the Taliban, under while there's continued strife and instability, and in Afghanistan is is going to continue to be one of those places. Um, I don't think anyone thought otherwise. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I there was in, Afghanistan has been that kind of place for a very very long time. So I don't. My own personal sense of it is it hasn't really changed that much. Um, I think whether we have eyes on the ground or we don't have eyes on the ground, whether we have um, you know, troops there, we don't have troops there. I'm sort of one of those people that is never really satisfied that we're 100% protected no matter what. So we could have you know, a enormous amount of presence there. And I still don't think that means there's a guarantee that nothing could come out of Afghanistan. So it really, it, it really comes down to what is your risk tolerance level. Um, and I, and I just think, you know, we, we need to start having a, a, a maybe a bit of a higher risk tolerance level. <laughs> Yeah, I would just add that I think there's the possibility down the line of power sharing agreements internal to Afghanistan and some spaces for women, uh, young women to go to school with 
you know, some kind of agreement with the Taliban, because the Taliban are learning that governing is exceedingly difficult on the ground in Afghanistan. I mean, they've governed before, and I use that term uh, loosely. So I think there is the possibility for some kind of power sharing down the line. I so I'd like to transition back to the previous question on the southern border, just to offer my perspectives now that I've gathered my thoughts. So never once while I was in the White House looking at the threat 24-7, again, sleepless many nights, did we have any reporting from of a terrorist that had been captured crossing the border that I can recall. And certainly it wasn't... Um, it wasn't notable if it happened. That said, I do worry, you know, about uh, border security. It, we should be concerned that there's a process for people coming into the United States. Uh, all of that said, very little of my team's focus was on the southern border. I can assure you that. And I have looked very closely at violent criminal gangs like MS-13, they pose a significant threat to U.S. communities from Baltimore to Long Island to the West Coast. So I have looked very closely at MS-13. So there are terrorist-like organizations that have the ability to cross the border. There are narco-terrorists, in quotes. Um, but for the most part, uh, if a terrorist wants to gain access to the United States, they will be able to do it in the southern border or through... in. In some cases, if they have clean passports, they can come to the United States, just like any other tourist. So I think it's we have to trust that uh, Customs and Border Security, they're doing their due diligence, but it is an unending proposition of protecting our borders and uh, protecting our ports, which is something we don't talk a lot about here. I'm not an expert on that, but that poses significant challenges, um, access to our ports and, uh, and controlling what comes into this country. All right, gosh, we have very diverse questions, but I'm gonna do one more terrorism related and then turn to some of these others. Um, Cause this is, this is an interesting big question. Uh, will the U.S. be able to do counterterrorism and great power competition without one taking priority? over the other that's me oh i love that question and absolutely yes <laughs> um the the u.s government can do anything it sets its mind to in my opinion um and this conversation has been you know this is not a new conversation within the government i mean chris will remember that too you know during his time the you know for those of us who are a bit on the older side who came into counterterrorism during the Cold War, which I did, you know when I first started there were Soviet troops in Afghanistan. So the um, the whole framework of the Cold War defined so much of our understanding of threats. Period. Right. And you know back then the the terrorist threats that we were dealing with around the world were largely the hot flashes in the Cold War. You know, they were motivated by Marxist, Leninist, leftist terrorist groups. Um, and, you know, that's that's what we were focused on. And I remember that very well. And I was an extremely young analyst at the time, but all of my mentors and the people that I respected and learned from were experts steeped in that kind of terrorism. So what's important to note is wherever there is political competition, wherever there is a conflict over whose form of power structure should rule, there will be a possibility of terrorism. There won't automatically be terrorism, but there will be a possibility of it. Terrorists are just the extreme fringe of those kinds of political competitions. So if we think that there's not terrorism within political competition, great power competition, then we need to go back and read the history books on that. But the other thing I think is important for us to be you know, wide-eyed about is we have focused and spent a great deal of money and resource and, um, you know, of course, resources in terms of people and energy as well in our global war on terror over the past 20 years. And again, I go back to the American people and the ability of the American people to be resilient because the message that has been sent around the world is that we can't tolerate this kind of attack. And I think that that potentially becomes a bit of an Achilles heel if 
if our adversaries abroad start thinking, oh, well, that's the way to, you know, wound the United States, um, then we need we need to be aware of that, right? It's if if people see that as we can distract them with terrorism, then um, that becomes a real, you know, again, a disproportionate problem to the 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 actual threat. You know, terrorism does not threaten our national security. Um, it threatens our national safety and our sense of safety, but not the the sustainability of the Constitution. So. It, you know, it really becomes understanding that we have to demonstrate and show our resilience as part of our national defense posture against great power competitors. Hey, thanks for that, Gina. And, and you're right. That is a great question. And you're right. I did wrestle with that as I was leaving the White House. That was the big question. You know, can we do both? And of course we can. We being the United States. And I made that point on record in several interviews that we're a great nation. The United States can do two things at once. It just has to be balanced. It has to be proportional to the threat. And I think it has to be more efficient. So those efficiencies are happening um, now because people in the counterterrorism community, I mean, you know this, Gina, now are wrestling, oh, do I want to get out of the counterterrorism community? Isn't it all about China now and about Russia? Well, not so fast. I think there's going to be plenty of fight, and I use that euphemistically, but there's plenty of threats that are out there. But we began in the uh, Trump administration General McMaster in particular, talking about great power competition on the first, the earliest days of the administration, at least when McMaster came on board as the national security advisor, this idea of great power competition really drove our national security strategy that was published in the first year of the Trump administration. My understanding is the Biden administration has been yet unable to publish their national security strategy because there's been such a dynamic uh, environment as a result of the Ukraine. And China now is pressing down on Taiwan. So we are doing more than two things at once. Just two weeks ago, we talked about it. The Zawahiri raid happened at the same time that Taiwan is is being threatened by China happening at the same time that we're arming and helping the Ukrainians in their fight. So we're going to have to do more than one thing at once, the United States and Western partners. Um, I was going to go a different direction, but since you brought up uh, Taiwan, we had a question about uh, Speaker Pelosi's visit. Um, any thoughts on on that? Any comments? about her recent visit to Taiwan. Yeah, no, that's that's outside of my area of, of insight. I, I, sorry, Chris, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I'll just offer my opinion on the matter. Folks said, do you think, Chris, that Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi, should go to Taiwan? That is a decision for you know the House of Representatives. That is a decision for the Speaker. Here's what I would hope happened. If the National Security Council and the president advised against it, then I would have hoped that uh, the speaker did not travel. I, but I don't understand the circumstances. I don't know what the facts are. Uh, I know that even on the ground in Taiwan, it was controversial. On one hand, it was a sort of a reversal of the policy the United States has had for many years. So there were some Taiwanese that were very, very concerned that it is making them more vulnerable. And others on the ground in Taiwan thought that this is really important. And now is the time to reverse some of the policies that for decades, the United States has uh, has more or less honored, for the lack of a better term. So it's a little bit out of my lane as well, but you see the reverberations. And again, Taiwan is very bellicose in their rhetoric right now. They're exercising a muscular military um, no, policy that certainly is concerning for other countries in the region, like Japan, for example. You know why I love history, Chris? Because you already have the answers to these things. Was it approved? Was it a good idea? You know, I, I know that's why I love I love history. I like having the answers rather than 
living where we live in the present of not knowing, but thank you for these great thoughts that get us to think more fully about what is going on. And I, so this is a question we don't get much about economic espionage and I am fascinated by it. And we have a cool gallery um, about it um, at the museum. And so someone wrote in, um, a frequent uh, guest on Spy Chat wrote in that, um, as you mentioned, the US doesn't do economic espionage, but there are comments about allegations that Airbus made that the US with German help was spying on them to benefit Boeing. Do you know anything about this story? Do you have any comments about that? I mean, I've read some of Brazil was involved with some of these stories. That seems like a really dated story that intelligence was used for competitive advantages. But I really have no sense for the facts. And, and there are lots of sensitivities with that. But uh, the United States, as Gina alluded to, uh, ha has to be very careful because of the international nature, the multiple dimensions of you know, business connections, the United States um, really eschews that. That's not something the United States focuses on. And how do you give one company some kind of advantage over another? I think that's fundamentally just works against the United States uh, ethos for intelligence. We don't give one company business intelligence. Now, what I can say with some assurity that counterintelligence information will be passed to businesses uh, by the FBI. For example, if a company doesn't know that it's being victimized by the Chinese, for example, because that's who we're, we were talking about earlier, the FBI has uh, very robust engagements with businesses in ways that they've never historically had. Uh, Director Ray and I talked about that in Sedona, Arizona. I don't even remember when, in the last six months or so. Um, so more counterintelligence information and not uh, espionage related collection. And you know, the, uh, the other thing I would just add to that is, you know, to keep in mind that companies have their own intelligence organizations, their own intelligence capability, I should say. I mean, it's not the same thing as the U.S. government intelligence community, but certainly as part of their own competitive advantage, they're engaging and gathering information that others would probably prefer to be kept secret. So, you know, they, they sometimes can get mixed up. Okay, I got a Hollywood question for you, Gina. One, one of our guests, who uh, a frequent guest, wants to know if the Jessica Chastain character in Zero Dark Thirty is based on you and your early warnings and intel. You know, I've never seen the movie. Um, so, <laughs> and I, I think I probably never will. I love Jessica Chastain and I love her recent movie, 355, which I absolutely love, was inspired by Agent 355. Um, but it is my understanding that the character is a composite of many characters. However, I would say I've also heard and, um, you know, in, especially in the reviews immediately following the film, that there was a certain amount of like, foot stomping and maybe even, uh, I don't know, be behavior that I don't think we would consider professional. Uh, that's not, there's no part of that in engaging in the counterterrorism mission or intelligence or, or anything else. I mean, yes, people have bad days, right? We all have bad days, we're human, but you don't get things by whining or, or I don't know, throwing a temper tantrum or being dramatic. I, I don't know. I, again, I haven't seen the movie, so it's not fair. It is entertainment. It's not a documentary. And the fact of the matter is, I think if the International Spy Museum does a fabulous job, and Cindy Storr says in the starbursting exercise, in reality, it took analysts and officers over 10 years to blah, 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 blah. That does not make for an excellent movie, right? You don't want to watch 10 years of people going, huh, what does this say? And what does that say? Because that's what it looks like. It is slogging and it's not a very entertaining story. So I think it's important to keep the two a little bit separate. 
I, I think you've made it clear why our interactive is more video. We have several interactives uh, about, uh, about Osama bin Laden. And uh, thank you for demonstrating what one could have looked like with the, the reading. So um, that was a great answer. And thanks for that uh, shout out. Uh, to the Spy Museum and also 355, if anyone's wondering, that's kind of a sleeper film. It's about women spies and 355 is the code um, number given for a woman in an American Revolutionary War um, spy ring. So that harkens back to that mysterious woman that everyone's always trying to uncover. All right, yeah. we're- It was the mother of American intelligence right there. So, you know, Ben Franklin said uh, three can spy if two of them are dead, hmm. but he didn't know an American female spy, I guess, because she kept her secret to her death. Gotta love that. Okay, now we're going to go really wide ranging, but because it was the anniversary of American Watergate in June, do either of you have any comments on this uh, recent what's being called, you know, Greek Watergate, the allegations that um, they were spying by the National Greek Intelligence Services into um, elections. They are into other parties there. Hmm. Gina, I, I don't know about you, but I have not seen that reporting. If our audience member has a link, uh, I'll certainly research it. And that's fascinating, uh, but I've not seen it. Apologize. Yeah. Usually, yeah, that, all over that, it. Um, that can um, that came out of the Washington Post um, just in the last day or two. So uh, that's why I missed it. Probably focused too much on this program, but I will go look at that, and maybe we'll uh, we'll talk about that in a future spy chat. So thank you very much for the prompting. I appreciate that. That's why I love our audience. And um, and someone and I missed this totally, but someone um, I guess says earlier there was a mention of Japan. Uh, can you elaborate more on that? Well, I mentioned Japan just in terms of the national security relationship between the United States and Japan has always been strong, but I think there's been some talk of redoubling the United States focus on working with Japan, even some talk of a five eyes, meaning a special partnership, a special relationship, providing more intelligence seamlessly to the Japanese, because it's their neighborhood. They are very much concerned, obviously, about uh, inimical, negative Chinese uh, designs for the region. So I think that uh, that is something we should pay attention to. Uh, Japan is certainly looking at their capabilities and concerned with what is happening regarding not just China, but also North Korea. All right. And um, I like this question. It you. You almost just answered that with talking about Japan, but um, do you foresee an increase in intelligence sharing between the US and allies um, in upcoming years, given the recent actions of Russia and China and the tightening of allies within Europe? So you've kind of, you've certainly answered that with this, um, with the Japanese content, but other, um, do you see other tightening up, sharing? going forward. Gina, you want to take that on, then I'll follow up. Sure. I mean, I think Chris and I probably think similarly here, you know, our, our allies and our alliances um, abroad are, are, they're critical to us. I mean, I, I hope Americans understand that they're critical to us. It's not just us giving away secrets. Um, those those partnerships, uh, you know, forged over hundreds of years and a lot of mutual sacrifice, um, lost, you know, bloodshed and, and lost treasure are some of the most powerful things we have going for us as we face all sorts of future challenges from the weaponization of space to, you know, more pandemics and climate change, like catastrophic stuff in the world. 
And, um, you know, trust is a huge part of those kinds of, of alliances and our closest allies trust us with an enormous amount. Um, they're valued secrets as well and insights. And, and so we really have to be responsible partners and reasonable partners and provide back. Um, everyone knows, you know, we, we, this America first concept that came into vogue some years ago, this is, everybody does their nation first. It's ludicrous to think otherwise. Um, that's where the tax money comes from, right? Like your citizenry, everything. I mean, of course you're gonna do your nation first, but that doesn't mean that you don't have um, a collaboration that is so strong that you build that trust over time and we're in it together. Yeah, I couldn't say it any better. We can't do it, the United States, without our foreign partners. And we don't say that enough. But without foreign partners, the United States wouldn't be successful in some cases on counterterrorism and in different areas where we don't have the intelligence coverage. But also uh, to just reinforce that I think the future, because all of the threats that we talked about just on this program, we have to rely on partnerships and intelligence sharing in ways that the United States has never done before. So I think that there's room for more intelligence sharing between the United States and other foreign partners, non-traditional partners beyond counterterrorism on things like climate change and sharing, um, you know, uh, the kind of imagery that we wouldn't normally share that demonstrates some of the risks and vulnerabilities because of global climate change and things that I never thought I would talk about on a spy chat, but these are real problems in the United States can't go it alone. And like Gina says, we all have all the intelligence services that we've talked about today have a sovereign responsibility uh, to protect their nations first and foremost in their citizenry. And that said, it truly is a global community. And that's why we love to tell the international stories here at the museum. Well, we don't have much time, at, but we have not talked about Ukraine uh, today very much at all. Just wondering if either of you have any thoughts about this strike in Crimea, um, the hitting of the, the Russian planes, any, any thoughts in a last minute uh, comment? So I would just, uh, since, since there's a bit of a pause there, I'll jump in there and say, uh, I think that we've talked about, you know, a grinding campaign that will continue, a war of attrition, a back and forth that will be horrific for both uh, the Russians as well as the Ukrainians. But it's the Ukrainians that are suffering. They are the victims here. Um, and just to tie it back into the fifth column movement, the challenges for, for the Ukrainians also to counter the uh, Russian intelligence activities that will continue to try to undermine President Zelensky and the Ukrainian people. So I think we're we're seeing a grinding campaign. There was some good news in terms of some counterattacks executed by Ukraine, at least good news, certainly from a Western perspective. So more to follow in future programs, for sure. If I have the last minute. <laughs> Um, slightly tangential, but um, just because the whole situation is so heartbreaking, um, I want to encourage your listeners to go back and read National Security Council Paper 68, um, the containment strategy, and really take note of what the authors of that paper defined as the U.S. purpose in the world and what they defined as the Kremlin or the Soviet Union's purpose in the world because the Russian nationalist purpose in the world is very similar. And what it really comes down to is recognizing that Putin, like others, looked at that script and our narrative at the time as, what, as a reflection of what we thought our strengths were and has been trying to weaken those strengths ever since. So the reason that's why it's so important to you know your enemy, know your enemy's view of yourself as well as know yourself, right? 
So when you, when you do that, I think the most important thing you'll find is that we defined our strength as our diversity and our tolerance of dissent, our, our, our pe you know, peaceful dissent. And more importantly than anything else, if we're for, we are the supporters of freedom, um, that paper says very eloquently, compulsion is the negation of freedom. So I think the more we demonstrate that we are willing and able to embrace dissent, diversity, um, challenge, the more we show that our structure of government, that re representative democracy is better and will endure unlike Putin's. I like those, I like that last word and we're going to do our best to dig up that paper and send it out in, in our thank you with links to um, Chris's articles, Gina's books. And as always, I wanna thank our guests for being here. I wanna thank our incredible speakers, Gina. It's really been a pleasure to get your viewpoint. It's so calm, it makes me feel really good and measured and really, really appreciate. Not that you don't, Chris, you are calm too, but it's always nice to meet a new calm person. So I want to thank you both for your thoughts. It, it really was amazing. Our next program, next virtual program is August 18th at noon next week on Russian intelligence. Um, so that is going to be quite fascinating. And you can um, get on our website and register for that program and other programs for people of all ages. And if you love these programs, if you love the Spy Museum, please, please consider making a donation. We appreciate that and it makes us feel so, so loved. And uh, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you. Yeah.